This song by Swami Kriyananda is titled The Hill That Was Tara. It's about where the high kings came together once a year to settle all their differences in Ireland. Tara's brave hill so quiet the day I came there Not a green leaf stirred on the air Not a bird did proclaim Ancient grandeur and fame Only ruins faint memories declare I marvel to think how can greatness e'er die? How can song disperse in the sky? How can hopes and dreams fade? How the warrior's sharp blade become dust? Was victory a lie? I stood there and pondered The great deeds of man's past How like clouds in the sunset No glory can last Even we as we labor To achieve some bright end Must accept after glory That the night must descend I've dreamed a broad rainbow Over thicket and thorn Over crags that called linger Your hopes are forlorn All too oft in my dreaming Courage turned to despair Till I learn that success is But the courage to dare as I gazed and thought sadly of Tara's demise, suddenly I saw her walls rise, saw her long regal halls, heard her people's brave calls, as though time had doffed a disguise and I knew in that moment the deeds that men do never die each victory is true every effort we spend gives more strength in the end till our gladness in life's ever new Every effort we spend gives more strength in the end Till our gladness in life's ever new Good morning everyone and welcome to Sunday service I'd like to especially welcome our guests here for the weekend programs how You Can Change Your Brain, and Chakra's Guide to Self-Realization, and also those of you on personal retreat. Hope you've been enjoying your weekend. My name is Nayas, Nayaswami Krishnadas. This is my wife, Nayaswami Mantradevi. I'll be reading from Rays of the One Light, weekly commentaries on the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita by Swami Kriyananda. This week's topic... By thinking, can we arrive at understanding? Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. There are many places in the Gospels where we see Jesus in open conflict with the Pharisees. That is to say, with the man-made as opposed to true mystical tradition. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 15, we see a good example of how they and he locked horns. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees from Jeru Jerusalem came and asked Jesus, Why do your disciples break our ancient tradition 
and eat their food without washing their hands properly first. Jesus, after scolding them for their hypocrisy and observing lesser rules so carefully while ignoring the much more important ones, said, Listen and understand this thoroughly. It is not what goes into a man's mouth that makes him common or unclean. It is what comes out of a man's mouth that makes him unclean. It wasn't that Jesus counseled against such wholesome practices as washing one's hands before eating. In an age, however, when lesser rules were given too much importance relative to the truly important observances, cleansing the heart of impure desires, for example, he emphasized the supreme importance of loving God and of communing with him. The Pharisees, the orthodox religionists of his day, in other words, had brought true religion down to a level of intellectual hair-splitting. They mistakenly considered the way to understanding to lie through a minefield of definitions, which they tried to refine to ultimate exactitude. Jesus taught, however, that the intellect alone can never lead one to truth. Without love, indeed, there is no ultimate verity. Without fixity of purpose, born of the heart's devotion, the intellect wanders endlessly. It cannot settle for long on anything. As the Bhagavad Gita says in the second chapter, the intellects of those who lack fixity of spiritual purpose are inconstant their interests endlessly ramified. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, Om. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's a joy to be with you. I'm going to read from Whispers from Eternity, Poems and Prayers by Paramahansa Yogananda. Listen to these beautiful words. A prayer. Open our heart, bud, to thy love, and let the fragrance of our love escape its prison of ego to merge in thee. On winds of cosmic perception, May our fragrance be swept to thy temple of infinity. O king of all true ambition, throw open wide thy windows everywhere, in the red cloud at sunset, in the rosy glad clouds at dawn, in every charm-clad dream of human hopes. Open the doors of all noble agitations that lead from our ego mansions into the vast panorama of thy bliss. Let our fragrance blow with thy breath, reminding all nature of thy unseen presence. So this topic today, by thinking can man arrive at understanding? Well, I think all we have to do is ask our IT services team, and they can easily answer that question. Because so often we call them, and we think we're thinking, but we realize that we really haven't arrived at any understanding, even after they've answered all our questions. There was one man who, he said his friend came up with what he thought was a brilliant idea for saving space on his hard drive. He said what he thought, he if he made all his Microsoft Word programs in a really small font, <laughs> it would save space. <laughs> and, and he said the friend he was with thought it was a good idea too. <laughs> so Paramahansa Yogananda said that intuition is the soul's faculty for knowing God and that inspirations and ideas come to us downward through into our conscious mind 
filtered by what he said was the, the myths of human preconceptions. So as we get these different inspirations that come to us, what happens is it goes through all these filters. Saint Teresa of Avila said that one moment of ecstasy and she knew more truths than would take her years of reason to figure out and to learn. So it's that soul intuition that gets the inspiration. But then it's filtered down through. It's filtered through our minds. And that's how we get everything from the universe is that it's coming through this ego, this mind, and these filters are what are influencing our thinking. The way that you're influenced is what you are habitually used to being influenced by, whether it's your subconscious mind, your conscious mind, your superconscious mind. And Swami Kriyananda said that the influence of our subconscious mind is much more than we realize. That we real, we've, have all these patterns that we've come to know. There's um, all the attachments, all the desires from lifetimes. The subconscious is a big reservoir that just holds everything. And it comes up and feeds our conscious mind in whatever way that we're habitually used to having it do. And as we... The subconscious mind is a little bit like the superconscious mind in that it sees everything as one and it's not hindered by logical assumptions. And so what happens is it can get its inspiration from the superconscious mind, but then it's, it's colored by all these preconceptions, by all these desires, by all these past habits. And as we, as we get those inspirations, it makes us operate in certain ways. Now, the subconscious can trick us easily because it makes us think that it's an inspiration. And that inspiration then seems really real, but it might not correlate to reality all that much. And the conscious mind hasn't got that ability to have that same flow. It has to learn things. It's, it takes things apart. It's the scientist. It's that part of our mind that sees all the problems, that sees the, all the angles. And Swamiji said that he could always tell when somebody was habitually used to attuning to the conscious mind because what they would say when he would give them advice, they would come to him for advice, and then he would give them a solution and they would counter it. Or they'd say, yes, but. Or they would say, uh, on the other hand, and it would always be this dance if they could see all of the different things that, that could be possible. But what happens is they're going around and around in a circle and you never arrive at the solution. I mean, having, you know what it's like having a conversation with someone that are, they're always countering what you say. And it gets a little bit frustrating. And it's even more annoying when you hear yourself doing it. <laughs> and you're the, uh, that person, you're always countering it. And, but I can do this, but I can see this. And that's what the conscious mind does. It, it can see all those possibilities, but it doesn't get the answer. So we go to the superconscious mind. And that's where the answers come from. That's where the intuition comes from. That's where that one time there was a little girl who was here. Her mother was taking a program. And um, I, somehow Hannah was with me a lot. She was eight years old. And uh, she asked all these questions that were just amazing. She would, she would sit in on classes and then she would say, well, what's a guru? And one time she said to me, she says, Mantra Devi, what's super consciousness? And I thought, okay, I have to explain this to the mind of an eight-year-old. And how do I make it so that she can understand it? And I said, well, that's the part of your mind that is connected to God. And, and I thought, well, that's right. And that's something that she, could, she was happy with that. That's the part of your mind that's connected with God that doesn't have that ego influence. And that's what we're all going for, right? That's what we're going towards. That's what we're needing to develop more is that balance of tuning into that superconscious and at the same time staying conscious and 
retraining our subconscious mind. You know, um, years ago I was in a leadership position and I really wanted to do a good job. I wanted to be really in tune. I wanted to have everyone else be in tune. And I was, after a while, I was starting to get pretty rigid, you know, with it. I would always ask myself, well, what would Swami do? Or what would Master do? And that's a good practice, very good practice, to always be thinking that and asking that question. But the thing is, I got, got, got pretty narrow to what I thought Swami would do or what Master would do. <laughs> and it wasn't a whole lot of fun. And I wasn't a whole lot of fun. And at one point, Swamiji said to me, he said, he said, remember to go with the spirit rather than the letter. And so he was telling me, okay, you can be creative with this. You can, you can think. You can, you can go with the flow more. And then another time, I was having a hard time with something. And, um, and I was emotional about it, I'm sure. And he said to me, he said, you have to go with duty, Mantra Devi, not with feeling. And he was, he was showing me the balance. You know, okay, in this situation you go with the flow because that's what's needed. You can't be so rigid. You can't be just logical. And in another situation, you need to go with duty. You can't go with your feelings, which were more emotions. And when you do that, when you go with your feelings too much in your emotional part of yourself, then that is going to color your decisions. Because reason follows feeling. You know, scientists are finding this out. I read an article not long ago where they said that uh, they're finding that people will not change through willpower alone, that their feelings are more important. That even if they need to take a, a, a medication long term to help them in the long term, then they'll not do it necessarily if it means discomfort now or expense or things like that, that they're very uh, reticent to take that longer view. They would want to do what they feel good doing now. In the same study at the end, just at the end, they, they mentioned, and the environment is very important too. So we know these things. We know that those are the things that, that are going to uh, help us but what do we go with? What, it's our choice. It's our choice, but what do you habitually go with? What is it that you're always looking to, to do? And um, here, here's a good story of a, a solution. This Zimbo, I'm not saying it right, Zimbabwean um, bus driver was driving, well, he stopped at a bar, an, an illegal bar, to have a few drinks. And when he got back to his bus, he found that the 20 mental patients that he was supposed to be transporting from one city to another had escaped. <laughs> so, he, so he didn't want to admit his incompetence. And he stopped at a nearby bus stop and he offered everybody there a free ride. <laughs> and then he took all his passengers to the mental hospital and he dropped them off and he told the staff at the mental hospital he said, now, these patients are very excitable and they're prone to bizarre fantasies. And um, they didn't find out for three days. <laughs> these poor people weren't the patients. I mean, that solution worked for him. <laughs> but <laughs> it wasn't so good for everyone else. So it's like when, when we're thinking, and what, what are the things, what level are we operating and we, as de devotees, as truth seekers, let's operate below the fabric of this plane. Let's go deeper than that. Let's not, not go with just what is usual, what our habits are, but let's take it much more deeper. And when we do that, we start tuning into that deeper level of existence that's happening, because it is always happening. And our hearts are the most important part of attuning to that divine ray, attuning to that intuition. And the two most important chakras are the um, Agna chakra and the heart chakra. And one is sending it out. Sending out is the radio, 
well, actually, it's not the receiving, it's the sending out part. And the heart is the receiving part. And when you do this to get guidance, then that's how you'll receive that pure inspiration, rather than it colored with other things. As long as you're really attuning to that higher nature and that higher consciousness, you need to send it out if you have a question, if you have something that you want to uh, solve, send it out with great clarity and great energy. And when you do that, then even if you're clear on a problem, that's half of the solution, isn't it? Because usually the solution follows when there's clarity. And send it out with energy, with a non-biased opinion of what you want to hear, of that acceptance and the courage, and the courage to take that answer when you do hear it. And then when you hear it in your heart, just really listen. That's what meditation is. Meditation is a, a still mind and an open heart. And opening up to that divine influence gives us that opportunity to go deeper every time and live this way always. So Swami Kriyananda, who is, is just our greatest example of living by intuition, where he'll catch things before other people will, or he'll, he'll know that don't do what it is that one must do in order to find the solution. And what does he do? He opens his heart. And he listens with his heart. And he listens with compassion. And sees the other person's point of view. Sees that other person's reality. And he's done this for so long, many lifetimes, I'm sure. And he is so attuned to it so easily. Like that beautiful song, The Hill That Was Tara. And there was Swami. He was standing on the hill and it, the, the ruins of this castle where these great kings lived. And he was lamenting the loss of that nobility. And then that thought came into his mind. And I knew in a moment that the deeds of men never die. And the victory of truth. And that, he was so attuned to that. He opened his heart to that. And it's so beautiful to be able to do that. Sri Teshwar, of course, was a master. And he, he said when he um, influenced the crazy man that stole the cauliflower from Master, from Paramahansa Yogananda, that he sent it out. He said, man will understand this and will invent this soon. And of course, the radio was invented not too long afterwards. But he sent out that beam that influenced that man. And so he could do that much more easily. We're just still learning. But the more we do it, the more we can have control over that. But then again, it's that heart quality. And, and that feminine quality, I was thinking about that. The feminine quality that's trying to come to the fore in this world right now. It's been, it's been needing to balance the world. In India, there are many women saints, and they're the crown jewels of India. Many masters are giving over their ashrams to women, because that balance needs to ha happen. And it's been trying to happen, but in a confused subconscious way, through the women's liberation, and, and women seem to think it was about bra burning or something. And it wasn't, it was always convoluted. And now then women tried to be like men, and that wasn't working either. So it's like that feminine principle coming to the fore, and whether you're a man or a woman doesn't matter. It's developing that feminine quality of just opening your heart and being in tune with God that way. And, you know, people all hear the lament often, I'm so busy. I'm so busy. I hear it from all over the world, everywhere. People who come here to the expanding light. People, I hear myself say it. I'm so busy, so busy. But what are we busy with? And how are we busy? The, the bumblebee is praised, but the mosquito is swatted, right? It's like, how are you busy? Are you busy? Yes, we, I, being busy is good because it brings our energy level up. It helps us to... to 
uh, not focus on ourself. There's lots of good things, good reasons to be busy. But it's what we're, not what we're doing, but how we're doing it. And the more you can do it with God consciousness, then the happier you're going to be. And that balance is what we all need. The great sage Agastya, he was a Veda, um, what was he called? He was called a Brahma Rishi. And he was one of the greatest sages of his time. And he was very realized, but he felt incomplete. And he felt like he wanted to learn and get initiated into the secrets of the goddess, into Sri Vidya. And he heard that there was a master that he could go and get initiated by. So he went to this master, it was a long ways away, and he had to walk for days and days to get there. And finally he got there, and he went up to this master, and the master said, when he asked to be initiated, he said, I'm sorry, I can't initiate you. You're more advanced than I am. But you could be initiated by my own guru, who started this whole path of Sri Vidya. And so he said, oh, yes, and I'm so happy to find that there's a guru that could initiate me into this. And so he said, now where is this guru? And the master said, the province that the guru lived in. And uh, he, Agastya said, oh, but that's my province. And he was ashamed because here he had thousands of students and he didn't know about this master that was right in the same province as him. And then the master said, what city, what village that this guru lived in? And Agastya said, that's my village. And then he was very embarrassed because he had never known this master that lived there. And then he said, describe the house. And Agastya said, but that's my house. <laughs> and then he said the name of the guru. And, Vid and Agastya said, that's my wife. And so he had gone all this way, and he had gone all the way back, and it was his wife that was the guru of this whole path. And he had felt like self-mortification was the way to God. And she showed him that the way was through being in the world. And she had been a housewife and taken care of her family all those years. And now Lopamudra was her name. Now showed him the way to God and he was complete. And that's so many of those crown jewels in India are the women working in the homes and keeping all of the, the religious energy alive in that whole country. And um, I remember when I was in India and one morning uh, several of us went down to the Ganges, down by Dasasamagat, and we watched the morning, the sun was coming up and there were these big concrete circles all over. And in the morning, the women would come down and they would come to the concrete circles and they all had their little mesh plastic bags full of little goodies. And the first one there would build a fire and they'd all do the puja. And they'd all do it every morning together and then take a dip in the Ganges. And that is the very fabric of India that it has held together by that personal devotion daily. Here in the West, we tend to do communal devotion, go to church once a week with other people. But in India, they do it daily. And we as yogis do too. It's like through our meditation and through um, that daily connection with God. So it's not in the rest of the day, they, they're busy. They're busy doing things for their family. But how are they doing it? They're doing it with that love of God. They're living beneath the fabric of this plane. They're not, not living on that plane that calls for busyness and calls for, for doing this and doing that. God doesn't care. He doesn't care if we're busy or not busy. He doesn't care if we can sing beautifully or not sing beautifully or if, we, you know, if, we're, a, if we're working or we're loafing. I mean, if you're working and you can't do it with joy, then that isn't working. If you're loafing and it brings your energy down to a tamasic level, then you need to work. 
It's like a balance, that balance between reason and intuition that's always going on, it's a dance. And I'll end with a story of this man who had always saw this homeless woman by the post office on 5th Street. He said, by in 5th Street post office, she was always there. And she was, he said he could smell her coming around the corner before he ever saw her because her rags would just smell of, of unwashed clothing and urine and, and her, her mouth, the teeth were rotted. And, and she, but she was always there. She'd stand, sleep standing up or she'd curl up on the sidewalk. And, and um, she just was a fixture there. And one time at Thanksgiving... They had a lot of extra food, and so he gathered some up and excused himself, and he drove down because he, he knew he'd find her there. It was a frigid night, really cold, and, or late afternoon, and um, nobody much was out. Most people had sought shelter or with, with families. And there he saw her, and she was squatting against a chain-link fence, and he thought, couldn't she even pick a place out of the wind? because it was just this freezing wind. And, um, and he drove up and he rolled in his shiny car with this package of food and, and he opened the window and he, he called out to her. He said, Mother! And then he stopped and he thought, Mother, why am I calling her that? But somehow it was fitting. And he said, Mother, I have some food for you. Would you like some turkey and stuffing and apple pie? And she looked up at him with totally clear eyes, and she said to him, she said with much grace, graciousness and manner, she said, oh, no, thank you, I'm quite full now. Why don't you take it to someone who can really use it? And then she dismissed him, and her head sank back down into her rags. So who was that soul? Who was that soul, and what was she doing? What was she doing? She's, Master used to say how Rajasi did more good than anyone could do by when he meditated. And so what was she? She was this little bundle of rags that nobody would bother.
Jesus, awake the day.